story which dominated much of the week was the changing media landscape. The two largest newspaper groups in the country, Fairfax and News Limited, have responded to the shift in media consumption, both putting more emphasis on the digital world. Fairfax made its announcements first, contained within, closing two major printing presses in Melbourne and Sydney and losing 1,900 jobs, both in printing and editorial. We are making the biggest changes to the business ever made and none of us underestimates the enormity of them. We're telling Fairfax very loudly and clearly that they should be ashamed of themselves tonight and that they Shame. should come out to come out and absolutely disclose where these jobs are, who is affected directly. This could be one in four, one in five of the remaining reporters going. We will be ensuring we work as efficiently as possible. Regrettably, this means that we will have to make a variety of positions redundant. This is a change that's happening and the, the best thing that these uh, organisations can do is make the transition quickly. The longer you deny it's going on, the longer you refuse to cannibalise your legacy business while you build your new one, the more likely it is that someone else will be doing the cannibalising of your legacy business. As well, this week, mining magnate Gina Reinhardt increased her holdings in Fairfax. Her intentions aren't yet clear, although she wants seats on the board. Both the opposition and government communications spokesman have warned her not to use her position to advance her commercial interests through coverage in the Fairfax press. She's entitled to representation, but what she's not entitled to do is trash the brand for all the other shareholders. She should be aware that that charter is something that the readership of the age, the Sydney Morning Herald, believe in and have supported over many, many years. And if she was to directly interfere and breach that charter, it would actually lead to a crisis of confidence in the, among the readership. I think we should all be very concerned at this turn of events. She certainly has a, has a commercial right uh, to do what she has done, but it appears to be that she will go a step further not respect the Charter of Independence. We don't want to see proprietors and the management of these big media companies obstructing the work that you all do every day uh, in, in writing the stories that, that we rely on effectively to keep this building honest. Amid talk about the media and with two reviews of media and convergence still awaiting a response from government, there's still talk about increasing media regulation, particularly on newspapers. One of those who has of late been no friend of the media is Labor MP Steve Gibbons, who's expressed strong views about the media on the social networking site Twitter. To get his views in more than 140 characters or less, he's joined Capitol Hill. Steve Gibbons, welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. What do you think is wrong with the media? Well, the problem with the media, and it's not just uh, print media, but the media, uh, we're seeing more and more uh, uh, concentration of ownership, but there is no accountability. Every other walk of life, uh, the corporate sector, the industrial sector, employee organisation, trade unions, are all subject to accountability. The only accountability that was in place or is in place for the media is the press council. And clearly it hasn't worked very, very effectively for the last four or five years. But, but with the broadcast media, they're, they're subject to rules for the commercial media and, and to some extent the ABC through uh, the Communications and Media Authority. The ABC has its own uh, editorial policies and mm. complaints process. So there's a, a process of accountability there, isn't it? And, and in the end, they're also accountable to their audience. If, if the audience doesn't like what they're saying, they stop buying or switch off. Definitely, but uh, I'm not too sure whether it's working appropriately. Uh, for example, we've just seen the uh, international company Apple uh, fined two and a quarter million dollars for breaches of uh, standards, mm. i.e. Uh, false and misleading advertising. I think an uh, 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 internet network company did the same thing, $2 million fine. Now, we don't see any dependencies like that in the media, so what I'm suggesting is that needs to be looked at. We do need an umpire, and as we get more and more uh, tightness, if you like, in media ownership, I see this problem worsening. We have to be prepared for that. Now, I'm not certainly interested in censoring the media. Uh, I don't think we should be trying to do anything about alleged bias in the media, it exists, of course it does, from both sides of the political argument, left or right. It's always been there. I suspect bias has existed in the media ever since man first started scratching things on bits of bark and rocks. And we will always have that. Uh, we won't do anything about it, and nor should we. But when bias, for example, in terms of uh, uh, vitriol, vengeance, hate, poison, 
demonising sections of society and there's no recompense other than through the courts, which is very expensive, then we need to have a, a, take a step back and say, well, how do we rectify this? And we've seen evidence of this very, very thing in the last few weeks. What sort of problems are you actually talking about? If you're not talking about trying to address bias or perceived bias, mm. what are you actually well, put it what this you way, have problems with? If a media outlet, whether it be a broadcast or print, knowingly print or put to air a story that uh, has the uh, potential to impact adversely on individuals, uh, institutions, society, and the material they use in that story is actually they know to be wrong, factually incorrect, they know that, but they put it to air anyway because of sensationalism or some other agenda, then there ought to be some penalty. So there ought to be an umpire to say, well, hang on, that's not acceptable. I have, uh, <coughs> what I'm advocating, uh, the Alan Joneses and the Piers Ackermans and the uh, uh, Andrew Bolts, they've got nothing to fear from what I'm saying, provided they uh, comply with what are the socially acceptable standards. Uh, uh, be accurate. By all means, hold governments to scrutiny, and if you want to continue the same line, you should be able to do that. Once you start interfering with that, you're interfering in the notion of freedom of the press and, uh, and free speech. Nobody wants to see that. But we do need some accountability because of the changing circumstances. It will be fair to say, though, that all those people you have mentioned are not, not known friends of the Labor Party no. and that, that your complaints could be seen because um, your, your government's not receiving the sort of coverage you'd like. No, not at all. Look, of course they're not. And the thing about them is where they do receive some respect is they're actually quite open about that. Uh, they, but they will look you in the eye and say, yes, we, we don't like this uh, and we'll keep running the, the lines we're doing. And they should be able to do that. Nothing should prevent them from doing that. But when bias, as I say, turns to viciousness, vendetta, hate, poison, demonising sections of society for whatever gain, then that's not acceptable to the community, it's not acceptable to anybody, and we need a penalty for it. How, how then do you regulate that without without stepping over the mark of, well, of being argued, seen to, to censor? I've argued for a, uh, an independent umpire, if you like. Now, we have independent umpires in just about every other aspect of community activity. The corporate sector has it, uh, the sporting fields have it, uh, everybody has it, it's there. Nobody seems to you know, take any notice of it until it affects them. And uh, what happened to, uh, to Apple and this other company hardly raised a ripple. People said, oh, well, that's the law and they've breached it. What I'm saying is there's no such law with the media and there needs to be. So uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, we MPs, if you like, are sub subject to penalties for breach of standards. We can lose an election. Or in the chamber, we're subjected to an hour's uh, suspension or a day suspension, quite common, or longer, which is not very common. So if we're able to do that with a media outlet, uh, a fine, but depending on the nature of the intensity of the offence, then maybe we ought to think about uh, putting Channel 9 off the air for an hour or hour longer. And I don't underestimate what that would do. That the, the network would probably never recover from it. What I suggest is if the mechanisms are there, you would probably never need to use it. Aren't these sort of things very difficult to regulate because some of the things you mentioned are a question sometimes of perception of what, mm. what side you come from, whether you see uh, something as vitriol or, or just a strong argument in favour of a case you believe in? No, uh, as I said, uh, and I reiterate, when they put a story to air or in print, that they know themselves to be factually wrong, and I'm happy to give you some examples. Uh, the uh, recent story with Channel 9 with the interview of the sex worker. Channel 9 said they've never put that story to air. Rubbish. They put it to air constantly with promos. So the whole story got out, but it turns out it was factually wrong, and they knew that. Uh, the other rival network, Current Affairs Program, made a great fuss about that. They put a story to air some months earlier demonising asylum seekers. They used material that they knew was factually wrong to paint a picture of entitlements that uh, uh, people waiting for asylum seeker status are receiving. Definitely wrong. Jonathan Holmes uh, corrected it on uh, Media Watch. Uh, even the ABC. The Prime Minister gave a, an address to the press club a while ago uh, on uh, likely scenarios for withdrawal, early withdrawal from their troops from Afghanistan. Now, she made it quite clear that that would be conditioned on a set of circumstances. Uh, first of all, the Afghan government being ready to be cha in, uh, responsible for its own security. Uh, it would uh, depend on the uh, NATO and ISAF conference in Ch Chicago, which was yet to happen. And if all those circumstances were 
uh, arrived at, then there is a case to bring home our troops a lot earlier. Now, that uh, was put there by ABC. There was an interview between a journalist and the, uh, 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 the newsreader, and the journalist indicated that there was every likelihood that the Prime Minister was clearing the decks for uh, a 2013 election, and that's why she was you know, going to bring the troops home. Now, nothing could be further than the truth. The Prime Minister didn't say that. She didn't say it in the same speech in Parliament she gave a few months earlier. She didn't say it during her address, and she reiterated that during a, uh, uh, the questions at that particular conference. But yet the story still got out that she was going to cut and run. Now, there are victims there, because just imagine if you were the parent, one of the 32 young men that gave their lives because we asked them to go there, you would ask, what was my son's life worth if the Prime Minister is going to pull the pin on what they've been over there doing simply because there's an election coming? Now, again, it was wrong. But, to his credit, Barry Cassidy corrected that on the Insiders program uh, the following Sunday. But the damage was already done. This is a, always a difficult area for politicians, particularly for governments, to look at. Do you get any sense that that... Uh, the minister responsible for this area, Stephen Conroy, is actually looking at tougher regulation for the media? No. Uh, look, we're certainly uh, he's reviewing the, the findings of the Finkenhurst uh, report. Finkelstein. Uh, yep. Finkenstein. I've, got the, I've read that report or the executive summary. We're yet to make our decision about all of that. I know Stephen Conroy is quite concerned about the way things are, uh, are shaping up. Uh, but also, no, he understands the legalities of what's happening. See, uh, Labor's been accused of being anti-mining uh, companies and all of that uh, because we've uh, been quite critical of uh, Gina Reinhardt in particular, but also others. Yeah, it's not illegal for people to be wealthy in Australia. If they've accrued that wealth legally and ethically and they want to buy up it into a media company, nothing should prevent them from doing it. But we need a mechanism on top of that to say, well, OK, you can do that, but there's a standard of conduct required. There's an, a, a method by determining ethics. And if you breach that, there ought to be a penalty. And what I'm on about is saying, making sure that there is going to be such a penalty. If I could ask you once again, just in a different way, why shouldn't this be seen as just a case of sour grapes that you're annoyed at, at bits and pieces of media coverage and, and what you are advocating is is using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut? No, certainly not. Uh, I put it this way, all of the people I've just mentioned and all of the media companies have never done anything to me personally. Uh, they have their right to report their, their, their stories. They need to do that. That's part of the accountability process for governments. And no government should be beyond accountability. No political party should be beyond accountability. But I say again, when they overstep the mark, they deliberately go out and uh, put to st stories to air or in print that they know themselves is factually wrong then that ought to be dealt with most severely. It's dealt with in the corporate sector, it's dealt with in uh, the industrial arena, uh, it's dealt with in just about every other aspect of our human life, but except for the media, and that mm -hmm. needn't be the case. It shouldn't be the case. Steve Gibbons, thank you very much for your time. Thanks.